Hello everyone. In the last presentation, the scope of Article 12, which specifies the authorities against which fundamental rights are available, was explained. In India, it is the constitution that is supreme and any law enacted by the parliament or state legislature and any rule or regulation made by the executive has to be in conformity with the constitutional requirements in order to be valid. It is for the judiciary to decide whether an enactment is constitutional or not. Article 13 lays down that any law passed by the parliament or any state legislature or a law which is already in existence at the time of coming into force of the constitution will be void if it is inconsistent with the fundamental rights guaranteed in part 3 of the constitution. The judiciary is entrusted with the responsibility of declaring such a law void. In this presentation, the scope of the various clauses under Article 13 will be explained. The Supreme Court under Article 32 and the High Courts under Article 226 are conferred powers to issue writs for enforcement of fundamental rights. Article 13 specifically empowers these courts to strike down any law, rule, regulation, bylaw, etc that infringes any fundamental right. By conferring this power on the Supreme Court and the High Courts, the Constitution makers have specifically provided for judicial review under the Constitution. Now, Clause 1 of Article 13 deals with pre-Constitution or existing laws, that is, laws which were in force immediately before the commencement of the Constitution. Under Clause 1, such existing laws, in so far as they are inconsistent with the fundamental rights, shall become void to the extent of the inconsistency from the date of commencement of the Constitution. Now, three principles of interpretation are used in applying the rule in Clause 1 of Article 13. The first principle of interpretation is that Article 13.1 is not retrospective in operation. All inconsistent laws existing before the commencement of the Constitution become void only from the commencement of the Constitution. Acts done before the commencement of the Constitution in pursuance of or in contravention of the provisions of any law which after the commencement of Constitution became void because of inconsistency with the fundamental rights are not affected. The inconsistent law is not wiped out so far as the past acts are concerned. Such laws exist for the purpose of all past transactions and for enforcing all rights and liabilities accrued before the date of constitution. The second rule of interpretation applicable is the rule of severability. Article 13 does not make the whole act inoperative but only such provisions of it which are inconsistent with or violative of fundamental rights. The power of the court to strike out invalid provisions of the act must not be exercised beyond the necessity of the case. But there is one exception to this principle. Sometimes valid and invalid portions of the act are so closely mixed up that they cannot be separated from one another. In such cases, the invalidity of that portion must result in the invalidity of the act in its entirety. The reason is that what remains valid is so intricately or inseparably bound up with the part declared invalid that the invalid part cannot survive independently. The intention of the legislature is the determining factor which determines whether valid parts of the statute are severable from the invalid parts. It should be asked whether the legislature would have enacted that part of the statute which survives without enacting the part found ultra-wires. The third rule is the doctrine of eclipse. According to this principle, an existing law which is inconsistent with the fundamental right becomes inoperative from the date of the commencement of the constitution, but it is not dead altogether. It is overshadowed by the fundamental right and remains dormant but is not dead. According to this doctrine, an existing law, that is, a law made before the commencement of the constitution, remains eclipsed or dormant to the extent it comes under the shadow of the fundamental right, that is, 
is inconsistent with it. But the eclipsed or dormant part becomes operative and effective again if the prohibition brought about by the fundamental right is removed by an amendment of the constitution. Now the framers of the constitution have ensured the guarantee of fundamental rights against the post-constitutional legislation also in Article 13, Clause 2. Now, Clause 2 of Article 13 prohibits the state from making any law which takes away or curtails any of the rights conferred by Part 3 and the law made in contravention of Clause 2 shall be void to the extent of the contravention. Thus, all laws made after January 26, 1950 and inconsistent with fundamental rights become void ab initio. There are two exceptions to clause 2 of article 13. Firstly, this statement is now subject to the provisions of article 31c, according to which laws made by any legislature for the purpose of implementing the policy of the state towards securing all or any of the directive principles of state policy would be valid even if such laws are inconsistent with or take away or abridge any of the rights conferred by Article 14, which guarantees equality before law and equal protection of laws, Article 19, which guarantees right to freedoms like freedom of speech and expression, freedom of movement, freedom of trade, commerce and profession, etc., or Article 31, which guaranteed right to property but which has been deleted by 44th Amendment Act. In other words, such laws may violate these articles and shall still be valid. Hence, Article 13.2 is to be read subject to the provisions of Article 31c. This is a fundamental change with respect to the fundamental rights guaranteed in Articles 14, 19 and 31. But as a result of the judgment of the Supreme Court in Minerva Mills case, not all directive principles of state policy will have superiority over the fundamental rights contained in Article 14, 19 and 31, but only the principles contained in Article 39b, which requires the state to direct its policy to secure that the ownership and control of material resources of the community has to be so distributed as to subserve the common good. And Clause C of Article 39, which requires the state to direct its policy to secure that the operation of the economic system does not result in concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment. Article 31, which confers right to property as a fundamental right, has been deleted by the 44th Amendment Act. There is one more exception to the rule mentioned in Article 13.2. Article 31b saves all acts and regulations specified in the ninth schedule even if the act or regulation or any provisions of the act or regulation are inconsistent with or take away or abridge any of the fundamental rights. This protection is available only to acts and regulations inserted before the date of the judgment in Keshavananda Bharati case. The validity of the acts inserted after that date will be decided on the touchstone of the basic features of the constitution. Under the constitution, protection against impairment of the guarantee of fundamental rights is determined by the nature of the right the interest of the aggrieved party and the degree of harm resulting from state action. What the court must consider while adjudging state action on a particular fundamental right is whether the infringement is the direct and inevitable consequence of state action. If the effect of the state action on a fundamental right is direct and inevitable, then it must be presumed to have been intended by the authority taking the action. The doctrine of severability and the doctrine of eclipse are applicable to the post-constitution laws also. Now, can a fundamental right be waived? The doctrine of waiver has no application to the provisions of law enshrined in Part 3 of the Constitution. It is not open to a citizen to waive any of the fundamental rights conferred by Part 3 of the Constitution. 
These rights are included not only for the benefit of the individual, but also as a matter of public policy for the benefit of the general public. It is an obligation imposed upon the state by the constitution. No person can relieve the state of this obligation because a large majority of our people are economically poor, educationally backward and politically not conscious of their rights. In such circumstances, it is the duty of the court to protect the rights of the individual. Now, what is law for the purpose of Article 13? Clause 3 of Article 13 provides the definition of laws and laws in force. For the purpose of Article 13, law is defined as including an ordinance, order, bylaw, regulation, notification, custom or usage having the force of law. The definition of law in the article is wider than the ordinary connotation of law which refers only to an enacted law or legislation. It includes even the administrative orders issued by an executive officer but does not include administrative directions or instructions issued by the government for the guidance of its officer. It also does not include departmental instructions. Now how about personal laws? Though personal laws which are not codified are immune from the challenge that they violate fundamental rights, as regards codified personal laws of the Hindus or any other community, the judiciary in a number of cases laid down that such laws are covered by the definition of the expression law in Article 13 and are therefore subject to the provisions of the fundamental rights. The question whether an amendment to the constitution is covered by the expression law in Article 13 was decided in the negative in Shankari Prasad and Sajjan Singh cases which means that an amendment to the constitution is not covered by the expression law in Article 13. But in Golaknath case, a majority of the judges laid down that the expression law covers an amendment to the constitution. Hence, the judiciary has the right to strike down even an amendment to the constitution if such an amendment is inconsistent with the provisions of the fundamental rights. This majority view was set aside by the Constitution 24th Amendment Act 1971 by inserting Clause 4 in Article 13 and Clause 3 in Article 368. According to Clause 4 of Article 13, nothing in Article 13 shall apply to any amendment of the Constitution made under Article 368. According to Clause 3 of Article 368, Nothing in Article 13 shall apply to any amendment to the Constitution made under Article 368. The validity of these amendments was considered by the Supreme Court in Keshavananda Bharati case and the court overruled the Golaknath case prospectively and upheld the validity of the amendments. All the judges agreed that under the Article 368, all the provisions of the Constitution including those enshrining the fundamental rights could be amended. However, the majority of 7 is to 6 was of the view that the provisions affecting the basic structure or framework of the constitution could not be amended. The 42nd Amendment Act inserted clause 5 in Article 368 in order to remove any doubt as regards an amendment to the constitution, according to which there shall be no limitation whatsoever on the constituent power of the parliament to amend by way of addition, repeal or variation the provisions of the constitution under article 368. The Supreme Court struck down this clause in Minerva Mills case and observed that this clause demolishes the very pillars on which the preamble rests by empowering the parliament to exercise its constituent power without any limitation whatever. No constituent power can conceivably go higher than the sky high power conferred by clause 5 for it even empowers the parliament to repeal the provisions of the constitution. The power to destroy is not power to amend. In Janhit Abhyan versus Union of India where the question was about the constitutional validity of the 103rd amendment of the constitution providing reservations for the economically weaker sections, 
The Supreme Court deriving inspiration from the preamble and the whole scheme of the Constitution held that every provision of the Constitution can be amended so long as the basic foundation and structure of the Constitution remain the same. Some basic features of the constitutional structure covered by the court are the supremacy of the constitution, the republican and democratic form of government, separation of powers, rule of law, sovereignty and integrity of nation, federal character of government, independence of judiciary, etc. Any amendment to the constitution made by the parliament is subject to judicial review and is liable to be interfered with by the court on the ground that it affects one or the other basic feature of the constitution. Therefore, even if an amendment of the constitution is not law within the meaning of article 13, it can be invalidated if by violating a fundamental right, it violates the basic structure of the constitution. Construction of the provisions of fundamental rights must be broad and liberal. When the constitutionality of an enactment is challenged on the ground of violation of any of the articles in part 3 of the constitution, its true nature and character have to be ascertained. The subject matter of the enactment, the area of its operation, its purpose and intent have to be determined, taking into consideration factors like the history of the legislation, the purpose of enacting it, the surrounding circumstances and conditions, the mischief intended to be suppressed the remedy for the disease which the legislature undertook to cure and the true reason for the remedy. In order to determine the validity or otherwise of a statute under the constitution, it has to be seen whether the legislature passing the law was competent to do so in the light of the legislative list in 7th schedule and articles 245 to 254. The territorial jurisdiction of the law has also to be examined. The law has to be consistent with the provisions of part 3 of the constitution. The law should also be consistent with other provisions of the constitution. The latest view on the power of judicial review is given by the Supreme Court in J.R. Thakur v. Union of India, wherein the constitutionality of the Central Vigilance Commission Amendment Act, Delhi Special Police Establishment Amendment Act and Fundamental Amendment Rules 2021 were in question. The Supreme Court held that the judicial review under Article 13 is a powerful weapon to restrain unconstitutional exercise of power by the legislature and executive. But while exercising the power, the court must remain within its self-imposed limits. It cannot declare a statute enacted by parliament or state legislature unconstitutional unless there is flagrant violation of constitutional provisions. The court further held that the legislative enactments can be struck down only on grounds of incompetency of legislature to make the law, abridgment of fundamental rights and manifest arbitrariness. When there are two views possible, one in favor of constitutionality has to be upheld even if it requires strained construction or narrowing down its scope. We have seen that the Supreme Court and the High Courts have the authority to strike down a law as unconstitutional on any of the above grounds. Now, how about a trial court? Can it declare an act or a regulation unconstitutional? If a trial court is of the opinion that a particular act or regulation is invalid and it has not been declared so, either by the High Court to which it is subordinate or by the Supreme Court, it has to make a reference to the High Court to which it is subordinate under Section 113 Civil Procedure Code. A law which contravenes any of the fundamental rights becomes void, but a declaration to that effect is necessary by a constitutional court, that is, the Supreme Court or the High Court, before a court can refuse to take action on it. Another doctrine that has to be taken note of is the doctrine of ultravirus which means beyond authority or beyond power. This doctrine applies to the laws passed by the legislature which it is not competent to pass as per the rules pertaining to distribution of powers and also to laws passed against the restrictions on the legislative powers laid down by other provisions of the constitution like the provisions relating to fundamental rights. 
the doctrine also applies to executive actions performed beyond authority as also by wrongful interpretation of rules erroneous exercise of discretionary powers and malafide or arbitrary exercise of power can also be struck down as being ultra vires this in brief is about the doctrine of judicial review which has been introduced by article 13 of the constitution for protection of fundamental rights thank you